and we will officially kick it off. So good evening again, everybody. This is the very first of the Pride Faculty Lectures in the 21-22 academic year. We're grateful that you're here and we're very much looking forward to tonight's presentation. I'm Dr. Megan Gibbons. I am the director of our Center for Global Connections. As many of you probably know, Global Connections serves as the campus hub, if you will, for all international education activities and initiatives. This week is an important week in, in our world in Global Connections because campuses across the United States are celebrating International Education Week. So it's especially meaningful to me that we're gathering this evening because as you'll no doubt very soon discover, this presentation really embodies and underscores both the importance and the value of international education exchange. So a little bit about the Pride Lecture Series. Um, this is a lecture series that's an initiative of the college's mission committee. And for this year's theme, we decided to examine borders and bonds. This could include exploring the role of these terms in various contexts that could be familial, communal, geopolitical, and so on. And additionally, it might include exploring the interplay between these terms, asking ourselves, for instance, how we maintain and nurture relationships while respecting boundaries, or reflecting on the ways boundaries might enhance or improve bonds among us. So at this point, it's my distinct pleasure to hand things over to Dean Draper to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Megan. I'm uh, Joseph Draper, and I uh, have the distinct pleasure to introduce Heather Joslyn Cranson, uh, who is the sister Margaret William McCarthy Endowed Chair in Music at Regis College. Uh, she and I and Jonathan Fitzgerald presented papers uh, together almost exactly a year ago it's for uh, Sacred Heart University and the Catholic intellectual tradition. Heather teaches courses in music and religious studies, and she directs the Regis Glee Singers. She's a scholar of liturgical music, uh, and is also passionate about travel and exploring the different cultures of the world. While in college, she spent a month in Southern France working on her language skills. And after college, she served for two years with the Peace Corps in the Russian Far East. Most recently, she participated in a Fulbright Hayes seminar studying the African roots of culture and history in Mexico, Mexico City, and various other places during August, 2021. And with that, Heather, the floor is yours. All right. Um, I'll be speaking for a little bit and then uh, moving to uh, screen share so that uh, you can see some illustrations of what I want to share about. But I have some opening caveats to share with everyone first. Um, first, like uh, Dean Draper mentioned, I had the great privilege of joining 15 other American scholars at university level in spending the month of August in Mexico in many different cities studying the history and culture of the African presence in Mexico and it was fascinating. So I'm going to try to do justice to the scholars and activists who shared so much of their time and energy and passion with us during that month. Um, but I also want to say that this is a new field to me and new material to me. I was quite a neophyte in Mexico. I don't speak Spanish to my great shame. Um, so I'm not an expert in this field. I can pass along what I have learned and that's what I'm hoping to do here. Um, but those of you who are historians or who have expertise in the field, please don't hesitate to chime in. And as a matter of fact, I'd say that if you have something pertinent to add at a particular point and want to put that in the chat and Megan at your um, discernment, if you want to go in and insert that, you know, feel free, feel free to, to jump in. I'll, I'll keep my ears open for that, even if I can't keep my eyes on the chat. Um, I, what I'll be sharing tonight is not primarily about my experience in Mexico, which I'd be happy to share with you all, but it's the content, the material that I learned. Um, though I'd highly recommend my faculty colleagues here tonight to apply for a Fulbright Haze and get your own experience. It was, it was a fan, fantastic and amazing trip. I also want to share a little word about um, terminology. I'm using the word root in the title of my presentation, and um, as a concrete choice, uh, there was a long time that the Mexican, uh, Afro-Mexican population was known as the third route in Mexico, the first route being the indigenous people and the second route being Euro-descended folks. Um, but scholars have recently said 
Why are they the third route? For much of the 1600s, there were more Afro-descended people than Euro-descended people in, Mex in the land that is now Mexico. So it should really be the second route. So that third route terminology has somewhat fallen off. Um, and I'll also be using the word Afro-descended to refer to folks who have ancestors from Africa. That is, uh, That was the most common designation that we encountered, uh, Afrodescendentes. So I'll be using an, an anglicized version of that. Um, as we've all been learning, terminology is very important and using respectful terms. And that seems to be the term of preference for people in the Afro-Mexican community. All right, unless there are any other notes, let me see if I can open up screen share. There, do you see my PowerPoint presentation? It's about to come on. Ah. There we go. Excellent. And let's see if I can. There we go. So there we have the overlooked route, the vital presence of Afro descended people in Mexico. From the earliest history of the conquest in the early 1500s, there were African descended people arriving in the land that we now call Mexico as early as there were Euro descended people arriving. So among the crew of Hernan Cortez's um, ship were multiple people with African roots. Obviously this image doesn't date back quite that far, but it does show uh, the conquistadors arriving and someone who seems to be a person, um, an Afro descended person there with Cortez. So from the very beginning, um, Euro, Euro descended folk, the Spanish in, in Mexico, specifically the Spanish, were bringing um, Afro descended people both from Europe and directly from Africa, and they were engaging in an active slave trade. So forcibly bringing people from Africa to Mexico uh, frequently to replace the indigenous population, uh, which was suffered, they say, um, scholars think that nearly 90% of the indigenous population of what is now Mexico um, was eradicated largely through diseases like smallpox um, and warfare as well. I will offer one aside. I um, asked a friend of mine who was on the trip, who was a historian, I said, well, it seems awfully unfair that the Europeans brought their diseases over and there was no reciprocation. He said, um, there are many scholars who believe that there was in fact disease reciprocation that, um, I can't remember which sexually transmitted disease was possibly from Mexico and bestowed graciously upon the European conquistadors who then brought it back to Europe syphilis, I believe it was. So there aren't, I guess, a lot of records in Europe of syphilis until the 1500s when the conquistadors would have been returning. So it's possible that that was a quid pro quo there. Um, but there was another reason for the slave trade in 1538 the Spanish church determined that native people, indigenous population had souls and therefore they could not be enslaved. Um, of course, they didn't determine that there shouldn't be slaves at all, but they determined that the indigenous were not to be enslaved and therefore the conquistadors needed to look elsewhere for a slave population. It's fascinating to compare some of those decisions to um, decisions regarding slavery in the United States. Unfortunately, the United States usually does not come off terribly well in that um, comparison. Many of the unwillingly enslaved people brought to Mexico were from Angola and places on the Northwest, um, not corner, but the, the jutting out part of Africa. Uh, so, so there are, it, copious records um, listing, listing people from Angola, although it needs to be said that many of the European conquistadors might just have assumed that if they have one enslaved person from Angola, they might just say that the others were from Angola. Um, some of those distinctions were lost after arrival in Mexico. Uh, later on, the slave trade came from a little further south um, and, and Western Africa as well. So you get people from Congo. Um, so, uh, right, Angola in the map, um, but Guinea and some of the Northwestern part too. So those were common 
um, places from Africa, where the slaves were brought from, we think that roughly 250,000 people were brought from Africa, largely in the 1500s and 1600s. The slave trade was really dropping off after then. Um, and as I said, the European descended conquistadors and plantation owners were largely ignorant of the cultural and linguistic differences between these people. So upon arrival in Mexico, whether that was at the port of Veracruz, let me see if I can go back. Um, there we go. So Veracruz is this little red uh, tongue that's licking up to the upper left-hand side of the map. It goes to the port of Veracruz. And on the um, other side of Mexico, on the Pacific side, is the port of Acapulco. And those were common ports where enslaved people were brought. As I said, on upon arrival to Mexico, they lost um, in the eyes of the conquistadors, they lost their differentiation from different cultures and they just became known as um, Africans or Blacks. There was another term that was used and that is uh, bozales. Bozales were unbaptized and unhispanicized Afro-descended people. So folks arriving in Mexico became, they started on a journey from being bozales, unbaptized and unhispanicized, to Ladinos, which was a term for acculturated people, people who are more comfort with it, comfortable with the Hispanic culture. Um, there were, uh, and, and these people were often assigned at particular tasks. One of these was being an overseer of indigenous people. So, there are records from 1531 recording that an enslaved African man was tasked with collecting corn and chickens from the local indigenous population on behalf of a uh, European conquistador. Now, while many of those who came from Africa were enslaved, not all were. According to scholar Herman Bennett, who we um, got to hear from and read some of his work, there were also free Black folk who traveled on slave ships as passengers. Um, and this brings up a recurring theme of our time together in August, which is that the history of Afro-descended people in Mexico upends our assumptions about slavery and about African populations growing up in the United States and hearing the history of the antebellum South in the Civil War, we may have a preconceived idea of what um, the slavery, slavery of Afro-descended people looked like, and much of what we learned in Mexico does not fall to that pattern. So this picture shows the, um, the fort in Veracruz, where Afro-descended people were often brought and sold as, quote, pieces of ebony. That was a term used in the early documents. Sometimes they were also branded on the chest or on the, brat, on the back. And these brands were known as kalimbos to mark enslaved people. Um, I recall one speaker saying that if somebody was then sold to someone else, a new brand might be placed. And sometimes a person's back might be so covered with brands if he or she was frequently sold um, that people complained that there was nowhere to put the brand, which is a horrible uh, thing to consider. So in Veracruz in 1571, at the location of this fort, 1571, about 200 Hispanic, uh, Spanish European residents, about 600 Afro-descended slaves, and a few free Black people as well. So clearly, three to one or four to one outnumbering the European descended people in Veracruz. Slaves were dated by people selling them, strangely enough, by checking their teeth and also, and I swear that I did not make this up, by licking their chins. The person selling or looking to buy the slave would lick the person's chin to measure beard hair as a way to discern how old this person was. In Veracruz, where this fort was, slaves frequently worked as divers to get stones. Um, I wish I have a close up picture, I didn't include it, but the fort the old uh, weathered whitewashed fort that you can see on the side is actually made of coral from under the water. There weren't good uh, locations for, for mining or quarrying stone on land. So divers would dive down and try to find stones under the water. Slaves were also employed as carpenters and lumberjacks at quarries where there were quarries and in other places. On the island of Veracruz, um, 
There we go. And these are two images of the fort there. Um, slaves who were employed there were allowed baths and shaves every 15 days. They were given two sets of clothes per year and they were expected to pray the rosary every night. So clearly there was some attempt at um, Hispanization certainly there. Uh, and it was, the fort was an awful place to live. It was a prison at some point and um, the, the mortality rates there were horrendous. Uh, everything was damp and moist and folks got sick very, very easily. So anything that anyone could do to find another post and get away from Veracruz was, was a goal. Um, Afro-descended people also worked with cattle. They were, um, they were known as cattle workers if cattle were new to the indigenous people. So um, that seems like a good match for the Afro-descended folk. They worked in mines, on sugar plantations, and often as indentured servants on haciendas, um, which were like large farms, you could say. Um, we were given a lot of information that upended, again, our assumptions, our United States assumptions about what slavery was like. Slaves were allowed to marry both enslaved people and unenslaved people. So there were a lot of marriages between one enslaved person and somebody who wasn't. Slaves were generally given Sundays off from work. That was the Sunday day, the Sabbath day. And so that was not a day for work for them. Slaves were frequently full participants in Catholic church practices. So they, um, they could receive the sacraments just as anyone else could. Now, Mexico had a free womb policy, and that's a policy meaning that any child born of a free parent would also be free, even if the other parent was enslaved. So if the mother is free, even though the father is enslaved, the child will be free. And for this reason, enslaved men might look especially for free wives so that their children might be free. And in doing so, they often looked to the indigenous population. So there was a growing population of African fathers with indigenous mothers, the indigenous being free because they couldn't be enslaved because they had souls according to the Catholic Church. Um, there we go. By the 1600s, as I said, there were more free black folk in Mexico than enslaved black people. So not only was the Afro-descended population larger than the Euro-descended population, but the free black population was larger than the enslaved black population. And we were frequently told by those who, the historians who lectured to us that the difference between free and enslaved folks wasn't always obvious. Some enslaved people had quite a bit of autonomy. For example, um, an enslaved person might be given the authority to travel and trade on behalf of um, the, the Euro descended quote, quote, owners. Um, and so might be, might be gone on his, generally his own, um, on his own license for, for months at a time traveling and trading. Whereas some free people um, working on a hacienda might have in fact very little autonomy and little chance to make um, independent decisions. So the distinction between free and enslaved didn't always seem obvious either for us as later historians or for people living within that system and negotiating and trying to, trying to make a livable existence. Um, there are glimpses from the records in Puebla, so that's further inland, that the slave market was moved because indigenous people blamed a growing miasma uh, related to illness on the Afro-descended people being slaved there. So the relationship between the indigenous folks and Afro-descended people was not always um, a, a friendly one, maybe is the best way to say that. Uh, we have some records that show that male slaves might cost as much as 300 or 400 pesos when yearly wages were between 100 and 1,000 pesos. So it could be more than a year's wages for certain people. Sometimes they were sold to be shoemakers or cotton workers in certain parts of Mexico. And there are a lot of records of accusations against 
Afro-descended slaves accusing them of drunkenness and theft, and of course of running away, which only makes sense. Um, at, for some records at this time, we believe that nearly a quarter of Afro-descended infants were born to unmarried parents. We know that some slave owners forced their slaves to procreate in order to um, acquire more slaves, unfortunately. There were multiple towns in Mexico that were started by its escaped enslaved people, and those escaped slaves were known as Cimarrones and then shortened sometimes to Maronas. So these are two pictures from one of those towns um, that we visited called Coyolio. And I will um, show pictures of that later. It's way up in the mountains. It was very treacherous to get to. So you can imagine that given the mountains and the forest, it would be a good place to hide if you were looking to stay escaped. Um, there's a beautiful mural on the side of the building there showing um, women in traditional Afro-descended clothing. And behind the two women is a picture of a bull. You can see his horns. I'll talk more about the bull later. Uh, the picture on the right shows three young women who participated in a dance performance for us, showing us some African-inspired dancing that the young people in the town still do, celebrating their roots. Now, the most famous of the escaped Cimarronas was Yanga, sometimes spelled with a J, Yanga. I rather wonder whether this is where um, Quentin Tarantino got the name for his film, Django Unchained, but I, I can't prove that. Yanga led a group of Cimarronas near the Rio Blanco, um, so in Veracruz, in the late 1500s, early 1600s. Uh, they threatened trade on an important trade route between Mexico City and Veracruz. So that threat um, enabled them to advocate for themselves. They could trade for rights, trade uh, for land, for cattle, and for power uh, by threatening the trade route. And trade was so important to the, um, the Euro rulers in Mexico City. So he negotiated for a while, was eventually, unfortunately, captured and executed with, um, in a group of 36 Cimarronas in Mexico City. And the town is now called after uh, Yanga. And you can see in the statue on the left, a little bit of the letters N and G um, for the town name Yanga placed in front of that statue. That one is the older statue. Um, fairly recently, folks decided that they needed a newer statue of Yanga in a town. And so the statue on the right is the new Yanga statue, both in the same town, both celebrating this strong leader. The town was only named for Yanga in 1933, because in 1933, um, many religious town names were suppressed by the Mexican government after the revolution. And so what was originally San Lorenzo, named after a saint, could no longer have that religious name and became named Yanga instead. Um, so we're talking about ways of getting out of slavery. Yanga and others escaped. Other enslaved people could work to free themselves or their relatives. Enslaved women in particular often worked to free their children and sometimes, heartbreakingly enough, had to choose which child to free if only enough to free one could be earned. Women also could marry and hope that their husband would pay to free them. Slaves could also be petitioned, uh, could also petition to be freed because of harsh treatment. Um, they could go to the Inquisition and accuse their master of harsh treatment. Often that worked in this way. The slave would be beaten and the slave would say, I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to have to blaspheme God if you keep beating me. The master continues the punishment. The slave would blaspheme knowing that the master would have to accuse that slave of blasphemy before the Inquisition. Very clever. Or if the master refused to, the slave might get other slaves or make, slave might him or herself might denounce him or herself before the Inquisition and say, I blasphemed. You've got to talk to me about this. The Inquisition was obviously not terribly um, keen on blasphemy, but it brought 
the master-slave relationship into the light. It was a subversive way of working the system on behalf of some slaves. And sometimes the Inquisition would hear the case and say to the, to the owner, you cannot punish this person so severely, you've got to lay off. Sometimes that did not happen, unfortunately, and one can only fear that in some cases, the owner having been um, made angry by having had this business brought into court might be even more angry. So um, sometimes the slaves hoped simply to be traded and to get out of that, that um, situation. Though it's, again, what we find in these cases, and there's so many cases of the Inquisition, um, can upend our ideas about what slavery was like. So we have the records about one freed woman, she earned her freedom, and when she died, she left all of her goods to the daughter of her former owner. Not something that might make a lot of sense from our position, but that's something that we know about. So, so like I said, it was un unexpected at times. This is an example of a a casta painting, or in English, maybe a cast painting. So with Hispanic conquistadors and indigenous people and folks from Africa, there was a large intermixture of populations happening. And this fascinated European audiences, so much so that there's a whole history of these casta paintings, folks painting what happens when a person of this background marries a person of that background and what their child might or might not look like. These paintings were created to market to a European audience to kind of provoke fascination, maybe titillation with, uh, with what was happening in Mexico. So clearly they've got an intended audience um, which is not historians. On the other hand, they often portray interesting facets of life. For example, the woman here standing over the child, you can see that copper pot under her hand. And what I believe she's doing is using her hands to roll a um, um, molinia. I think I pronounced that right, back and forth. It's a tool for whipping up or frothing up hot chocolate. Um, and chocolate was associated with Afro-descended women in particular. It was a bit of a um, aphrodisiac. So sometimes we do get glimpses into historical realities from these casta paintings. Um, and they led to a wide variety of terms like pardo and marisco and mareno. So um, similar to terms like octoroon and others in the United States where there was an attempt to quantify where people were coming from. That same thing was happening in these Costa paintings. Here's a second one. And this one rather warns of the strength and determination of Afro-descended wives. <laughs> so there were some stereotypes that were frequently shared through these Costa paintings as well. Um, maybe encouraging husbands to think twice about having such a fierce wife. Um, it also implies, this painting also implies something about her care of her child, which I think is not a fair implication. But again, these were created as entertainment for a European audience, not as history. We also know on the records that morenas and mulatas, two terms for Afro-descended women, were not allowed to wear gold jewelry, but we know that they did. Right? That's the old historian rule. If there are rules against something, you know those rules exist because it was happening in the first place. Um, so as I said, we have a lot of information about the lives of Afro-descended people in Mexico, be thanks to the Inquisition. Um, usually they're not given a lot of credit or looked at very favorably, but they kept great records, which is a boon to historians now. This is a picture of the, the Inquisition building in Mexico City, right around the corner from the Basilica and right across from a plaque dedicated to Afro-descended people in front of St. Um, Dominic's? Try to remember the name of the church now. Um, so some of the records that we get are fascinating and enlightening and like I said challenge our ideas about slavery. As one example we have stories about Juan Correa. Juan Correa was a painter 
In the Baroque style in Mexico City, he lived from 1646 to 1714, especially known for his work in churches, particularly in the Basilica in Mexico City. He painted the sacristy, the area where the priests go to reserve the elements and put on their clothing. Um, and it has walls full of these rich, ornate, detailed paintings, just like you see here. The previous page was his um, signature on one of these walls gorgeous, gorgeous paintings. And just for reference, there's the Basilica from the front, or the cathedral, not the Basilica, pardon me. Um, Juan Correa was a mulatto, so he, we know that he had Afro-descended ancestors. He taught painting, and it's likely that he employed other mulattoes in his studio. However, he also had relatives who were enslaved, and he himself owned a slave at one time because we have records of him selling this female slave. So again, it's a very mixed picture of what life could be like for Afro-descended people, both free and enslaved. But we know that mulatto painters in the visual arts and musicians in the musical arts contributed greatly to religious life within the Catholic Church in Mexico. Um, there are a couple of saints who are especially beloved by the Afro-descended population in Mexico, uh, the first of whom was San Benito de Palermo, whose father was African, and the saint dates back to the 1500s. This was the first saint, quote, quote, marketed to the Afro-descended population in Mexico. He was seen as an ally, someone with whom folks would have something in common. Later, um, San Martin de Porres became another well-beloved saint from the Afro-descended community in Mexico. So he became popular a little later. And these two images are from statues of these saints in the cathedral in Mexico City. Also, Saint Iphigenia, who is a female counterpart to Saint Benito, San Benito, um, there wasn't a statue of Saint Iphigenia there, so I couldn't get a picture about that one. Um, I did say that this story would be largely about what I learned and not my own experiences, but I'm going to make one short um, exception here. When I was in Puebla and visiting a very beautiful chapel of the rosary, I believe it is, in a lovely Baroque church, we had to wait for our timed entry into that chapel. So I wandered to the gift shop as I am frequently prone to do and saw this uh, prayer card of uh, St. Martin de Porres. And I thought, well, that's fantastic. And this is an especially African looking depiction of him. They aren't always. So I thought, well, you know, here's a prayer card for 20 pesos. This would be fantastic. So I purchased the prayer card um, with my three words of Spanish that are usable. And the woman said, oh, I'll give you a bag for that. And then she said, oh, wait, I have something else for you or something to that, that extent. And she gave me this small card the picture on the left is the front of it. There's St. Martin de Porres, and you can see a funny little circle underneath that. That circle is a fragment of fabric that was touched to his body. And then a prayer to St. Martin de Porres on the back. This is a relic. I was given a relic of St. Martin de Porres um, by this woman in the Puebla church. Uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what to do with it. As a United Methodist, we don't trade in relics usually. So, um, but I have one, so I can clearly need to continue my connection with San Martin de Porres. All right, uh, let me get here. Okay, so Afro the Afro-descended community could engage in Catholic practices and often did, but there were rules. Um, Afro-descended women were not allowed to become nuns and men could not be brothers or priests. Uh, they could partic participate in confraternities known as cofrandias, and these cofrandias were lay organizations, so not for priests, not for ordained folk, dedicated to particular saints or feasts. The cofrandia would collect money to pay for candles and parades to honor the saint on his or her feast day for celebrations, but also to support the members themselves and especially regarding funeral payments. So if you belong to a cofradia and you made your contributions regularly, that when you died, your funeral care would be taken care of, would be paid for by your sisters or brothers in the cofradia. There were many cofradias 
organized specifically by Afro-descended people for Afro-descended people. There were also many convents that owned slaves or individual nuns that owned slaves. And that seems like a horrible distortion of the Christian faith from our perspective, but it was a historical truth that happened. Um, now, as I said, Afro-descended folk were not allowed to become nuns. There is one amazing exception, and that's Juana Esperanza de San Alberto. She was a servant in the convent, um, served faithfully, scrubbing floors, cleaning things. And on her deathbed, her religious community spoke so highly of her sanctity that they allowed her to take the vows to become a nun on her deathbed. So just before she died, Juana Esperanza de San Alberto became Sor, Sir Juana. Um, so there's the, the one example that proves the rule. These slaves, as I said, engaged with a lot of cleaning, but they also um, were useful to the nuns and that the nuns who had no access to the out outside world could use these uh, descended enslaved folk to go into town and get them items that were forbidden to the nuns. So they had a sneaky way to smuggle things into the monastery. Now, Afro-descended folk were also engaged in non-Catholic religious practices, which makes sense, practices that may date back to their African traditions, and that often also borrowed from indigenous traditions as well. They were often accused of engaging in witchcraft especially in love magic to aid in relationships. And that could be relationships between a woman and a man, but more frequently also relationships between enslaved and slave owner. An enslaved person might come to an Afro-descended woman who was known for engaging in these practices and say, I need something to sweeten up my quote, quote, master because the treatment is unbearable and I need our relationship to be, to be more positive. These women were known, and they were usually women, known for predicting the weather, for sometimes even being able to summon the dead. They used herbs for healing as well. So it wasn't always what we would consider magical practices. It might be what we might consider indigenous medicine or herbal medicine, but they could frequently be turned into the inquisition by unsatisfied customers. So if a healing or a romantic pursuit on the behalf of someone didn't turn out, that woman might be turned into the inquisition. Now the inquisition judged Euro-descended folk and Afro-descended folk, but not the indigenous. They were understood to be outside the pale of the inquisition. They were allowed to have their own practices and could not be judged for that. So sometimes in order to ensure their own safety, Afro-descended people might ask to be classified as indigenous rather than Afro-descended. We'll talk a little bit about that more, but the sort of change of classification could help. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of records from the Inquisition about the crime of blasphemy, which was the most common crime of African descended folk because it could be used to stop harsh punishments and bring the cruel treatment of owners into the light. Um, we believe that the enslaved population in Mexico peaked around 1646 with roughly 35,000 persons. And we know some of um, the behaviors associated with the Afro-descended population in Mexico City. For example, this is an older picture of the Alameda, a beautiful green space in the heart of Mexico City, not very far away from the cathedral. It was a prominent place to go strolling for the well-to-do. So young men, young um, Euro-descended men might bring their young ladies to the Alameda as a, um, a possible date to stroll around, in part to see well-dressed Afro-descended people, because even viewing someone um, with African descent was seen as a sort of aphrodisiac. So these young men would parade their young women in front of well-dressed Afro-descended folk to get them in the mood. I have no historical records as to whether that actually worked or not. Mulatta women, um, so women of Afro descent as well, were used to attract crowds in the Alameda to sell pulque, which is, um, is another 
picture of the Alameda. And here's a glass of pulque. It's a fine, a kind of alcohol derived from cactus. So it, a little similar to tequila, um, a much sweeter taste. I found and, and it can be made with a lot of different flavors, a uh, very popular drink in Mexico, but marketed using Afro descended women to attract crowds in the 1600s and 1700s. Now, um, the slave trade largely dwindles up in the early 1700s in Mexico. So after that, there's no direct influence from Africa per se, but a lot of influence through from Africa through Cuba, because there were many Afro-Cubans who um, traveled back and forth between Mexico and Cuba. Jumping ahead a little bit, in 1790, we know that roughly 17.5% of the population in Mexico was Afro-descended, so nearly a fifth of the entire population. And that number was much higher in certain regions in Mexico. So Southern Veracruz in a region known as the Sotavento, um, it, in the 1700s, um, folks measured roughly 60% of the population was indigenous, 34% of the population was African, and only 6% Euro descended. As I mentioned earlier, people could be assigned to different castes or calidades, qualities, in order to offer them different rights. We noted the Inquisition doesn't have sway over the indigenous population. So in that respect, being known as indigenous rather than Afro descended could help you escape punishment. However, Indigenous people were not allowed in the militia and Afro-descended people were. We know of one man, Esteban Jose, in the 1500s, uh, 1700s, pardon me, he was kicked out of the militia for being called mestizo, in other words, Indigenous, some mix of Indigenous and Eurofolk. And he asked for a letter from his priest stating that he was either pardo or moreno terms for Afro-descended folk so that he could resume his job in the militia. Strange that a signed piece of paper could make this change happen, but that was one path for, um, again, making a livable situation under the system. By 1792, 70% of the militia in what is now Mexico was mulatto, so was Afro-descended to some extent. So that was a place, the militia was a place for respect, work, employment. It could be a path forward for many people. Springing us to the early 1800s. So by 1810, many Mexican territories were passing laws forbidding slavery. Um, this is the time of the beginning of the war for independence from Spain. There were roughly 10,000 slaves at this time, um, and the enslaved folk were less than 10% of the Afro-descended population as a whole in Mexico. So the numbers are clearly much smaller than they were and on the way out. This is an image of Miguel Hidalgo. Um, he was a priest and a rebel leader. Uh, so he declared that slavery should be abolished in 1810 as part of his revolt against Spain in leading communities of indigenous and Afro-descended people. So at this time, Mexico also abolished the caste system. So documents from the Inquisition or wherever no longer differentiated between indigenous people uh, Afro-descended people using Pardo, Moreno, all the, those different, mulatto, all those different terms. Um, this is certainly a boon for people if they were all seen equally. However, it is a loss for historians who often want to quantify what percentage of the population was doing this or that or the other, or keep records of what was particularly happening to the Afro-descended population in Mexico. Now, Spain allowed slavery at the time, so uh, abolishing slavery was a way of that Mexico could differentiate itself from Spain and also from the United States, its neighbor to the north, and that becomes very important. Following independence, 
Mexico, according to some scholars, Mexico underwent what they uh, what they call a whitening. So it was impossible to deny the indigenous heritage in Mexico, but often the African heritage was covered over. And we'll hear more about that later following the um, Revolutionary War. So this rhetoric was part of independence, acknowledging that Mexico had a mixed population of Euro and indigenous people and demonstrating pride in what they called this mixed blood. But the importance of the African heritage was sometimes lost in that uh, rhetoric. Now, by the 19, by the, pardon me, the 1820s, 16 out of the 19 Mexican states had either abolished slavery or had adopted a free womb, free womb policy, which would eventually eliminate slavery. If everyone born from a free woman was free, that would work towards eliminating slavery. However, where slavery still held out, held out in Mexico was the northern part of the country because American settlers were welcomed to help populate these sparsely populated regions of the land. And politicians understood that the price of attracting and keeping American settlers was allowing slavery. So slave owners from Louisiana and parts north um, would travel given the promise of free or cheap land to Mexico, but they had visions of this as agricultural land and in their imagination, agriculture required slavery. Amazingly enough, the horrific trope of Mexicans being thieves, which we have heard um, politically over the past several years, uh, may date back to this time because when Americans were bringing enslaved Afro-descended people with them into Mexico, Mexicans would often help those enslaved people escape and thus were accused of stealing the slaves by American slave owners. Um, so this, this uh, accusation of theft goes back to the early 1800s. Um, now, as I said, um, slavery was abolished early. Vicente Guerrero became um, president, leader of Mexico, president, I think this is the term that he used, in 1829, uh, and he abolished slavery then. This is following the uh, war for independence, but he accepted Mexican Tejas in the north because again, the political situation, they, they wanted those American settlers to come and fill up this land and, and, um, and become Mexicans. Congress overturned his um, declaration in 1831. So it the country as a whole waffled back and forth a little bit about this. Um, now Guerrero, as you can see here, was born to grandparents who were mulatto, but they also spoke Nahuatl, which is the a language of some of the indigenous people in Mexico. So he had strong connections to both the Afro-descended community and the indigenous community. He started his career as a mule driver. He became involved in the war for independence in 1810, and he rose in rank as white leaders were killed. He was especially gifted at war in the mountainous ranges, which he knew very well. He helped to negotiate peace with Iturbide, the, um, the uh, ruler from the other side, and helped to negotiate independence in 1821. He was not well loved by other political leaders in Mexico who tried to suppress him and keep him down, but he was beloved by indigenous and Afro-descended populations to the extent that during elections in 1828, when Vincente Guerrero came in second in the elections, his supporters revolted and required Congress to appoint him president instead of the person who actually got more votes. I can't speak to the um, accuracy or um, fairness of the election, but although he came in second, he was appointed president. See, and his presidency scared the wealthy and the powerful. He was seen as too much of a populist. Um, he would not help them retain their wealth. So they responded in horrendous fashion by criticizing his skin color and his lack of education. Some of the terms that were thrown against Guerrero included um, this monstrosity of negritude. He was referred to as an orangutan. 
as a barbarian and um if i can get this one to write into english as the abortion created by a savage and a fero feroce, um, ferocious African. So his critics did not refrain in the least from slandering him and using his um, Afro-descended background to insult him in the worst possible fashion. He was ejected from power only a year after the elections in 1829. He was accused of starting a race war. And while he was fleeing, he was ultimately betrayed by a member of the Italian Marine, betrayed to his opposing party, and he was executed in 1831. So this is the first president of Mexico with African roots. Um, wildly popular and very terribly treated, unfortunately. There were no portraits made of Guerrero while he was alive. Later portraits vary immensely in the extent to which they show his African heritage or not. This was one we visited in um, Chapultepec Park at a, a castle up at the top of the mountain um, that functions as a sort of historical museum now. So I think the the creator of this painter did want to make evident that he had some Afro-descended roots, but there are pictures of him, and particularly in Mexican textbooks, they don't seem to betray that at all. So abolishing slavery gave Mexico the moral high ground against the United States, and it also allowed them to have something positive to cling to after the immense loss of territory to the United States during the Mexican-American War. Um, Mexicans also had the hope that enslaved people in the United States would hear of freedom in Mexico, cross the border into Mexico, and help fight to retake that land on behalf of Mexico, the land that we now know as Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and so on. There were communities, many communities of escaped American slaves in the northern part of Mexico, including the Black Muscogee. So there were um, a mixture of Black and Cherokee, I believe, folk um, from the United States who were living in northern parts of Mexico. Um, this is also an under-told tale of the pre-Civil War and Civil War. Um, we always think of the Underground Railroad moving north up to New England, up to Canada. There was a large part of the Underground Railroad that went south, and there's a fantastic book called South to Freedom about enslaved people who made their way to Mexico or tried to make their way to Mexico because they knew that they would be free there, as well as the history of Americans crossing the border into Mexico to recapture the, um, the people that they considered their property. Uh, historians of this era also really believe that Mexico's status on slavery greatly affected the coming of the Civil War because um, the United States was not sure whether new territories that were becoming new states had the right to choose their own policy on slavery. Um, there was a United States policy that they couldn't change their status about slavery. If they were a slave territory, then when they became a state, they would have to be a slave state. Well, all of the Mexican land was technically free since Mexico had abolished slavery. So land that had been part of Mexico and was seized by the United States, did that land have the right to become slave states? Should that land become free states? This really worried um, advocates on both sides and led to the growing unease that led to the Civil War. That brings us to the early 1900s. So from the war for independence from Spain to the war, the revolution in Mexico in the early 1900s. This was Mexico um, denying the rule of the wealthy and trying to find a place for um, what sometimes referred to as peasants for the ordinary people. Um, here's an image of uh, a Revolutionary War image from the great Mexican muralist uh, Siqueiros. And following this revolution, Mexico needed to rebuild its national identity. Who are we now? How do we speak about ourselves now? And Mexico adopted the term mestizaje to 
describe its population and mestizaje means mixture. So the idea was that we are a mixed people. Generally that mixture was seen as indigenous and European. And again, that concept of mestizaje simplified the history of Mexico and invisibilized the African population even more at that time. So if Mexicans are by definition mestizaje, a mix of indigenous and European roots, then Afro-descended people cannot be by definition Mexican. So it placed Afro-descended communities in a distinct disadvantage and a difficult place. Um, there are scholars who say that at this point, the country of Mexico was practicing a pedagogy of oblivion, trying to hide away the history of its Mexican roots so as not to complicate this concept of mestizaje. So the country as it stands now and the culture as it stands now has descended out of this challenging difficulty. And there are many people who ask in the 21st century, why should we be African? They may know that they have some African roots in their family, but they have been so long told that that's not important, that the distinction, oh, now we're Afro-descended, can feel imposed or foreign or strangely arbitrary to a lot of folks. Um, we discussed this a lot and the people in our group were particularly interested and often frustrated by the conversation in Mexican culture about race. First of all, the word race was generally not used um, by Mexicans to describe themselves. So therefore, if there is no race, there can be no racism, which was challenging. So Mexicans tend to, blend, to blame problems on classism or on ethnic discrimination, but they frequently do not call out racism per se. And maybe this is because everyone was assumed to have mixed blood. If everyone is mestizaje, then one person can't be picking on another person because we are all mixed. Um, it's, it's a complicated construct and a very different run from what we uh, abide by the United States. So it, that was a place of challenge for European, um, United States scholars in Mexico. However, the Afro-descended um, population in Mexico maintains its vitality, and they do that through celebrations, in particular, um, Carnival. And here's another photograph from Puerlio, the town founded by um, Cimarrones that we visited in the mountains outside of Jalapa. That's where we were. Um, so Carnival, the week up to Ash Wednesday, was a huge, understood as an Afro-descended, an African-influenced celebration for this community. There is somebody who is the bull here. And he is often called the disguised one or the black one. Incidentally, the bull used to be required to be played by a man. And just recently, the women of Coelho have said that they too can be the bull. So sometimes they are they dress up as the disguised one. And the bull appears at festivals and is both really bright and festive and a little intimidating with the horns. So there's a mix of symbolism there. Um, during, during the celebration during Carnival, uh, foods that come from the Afro-descended population, like banana cake, are common. Um, there was one woman in particular on our group who was from the Dominican Republic. She had family from the Dominican Republic, and she was astounded by the banana cake that felt so familiar to her and her family, given the African roots in the Dominican Republic. There are actually a lot of foods uh, popular in Mexico that seem to have African origins, like yucca, and that's the white um, starchy ones in the upper right that have uh, kind of brownish bark around them. Uh, black beans and black eyed peas I don't have pictures of. Hibiscus, the red flowers on the upper left are hibiscus flowers. We had wonderful hibiscus um, drink. And tamarind, the seed pods down below the hibiscus. hibiscus. Uh, coffee, cumin, Plantains, sweet potato all seem to have connections to Africa, even though they feature 
uh, prominently in Mexican cuisine, and tripe. There's some beef tripe in the bottom right, also um, commonly associated with African food. There has recently been a lot of attention paid to the Afro-descended community in Mexico. Um, in 1996, a museum in the state of Guerrero, which is on the Pacific coast and is one of the states with the highest Afro-descended populations in Mexico, the Museo de las Culturas Afro-Mestizas was founded in 1996. This is a blurry photograph, I apologize. Um, I have to say, this came from the web. We were not allowed to visit Guerrero out of fears for safety because it's not always the most peaceful place. But you can see behind the um, stakes, a thatched roof conical building. And that's a building uh, of traditional Afro, Afro African construction. In 1997, uh, the group Pueblos Negros had its first meeting. In 2001, there was a worldwide conference against racism in Durban, and that um, gave a lot of incentive to the Afro-descended community in Mexico to continue its work. In 2013 and 2014, the rights of Afro-descended populations were recognized in the states of Oaxaca and Guerrero. Oaxaca also is on the Pacific coast near Guerrero, um, so near the port of Acapulco. 2015 through 2024 was designated as the International Decade of Afro-Descended People. And um, I note that we still have a couple of years left in that decade, and I wonder how we might be able to celebrate here at Regis. Finally, and maybe most importantly to a lot of the scholars we talked about, there was a census in Mexico in 2020, and scholars and activists worked very hard to get a question on the census to ask Mexicans to what extent they believed that they had African roots in their families. They had to do this while avoiding the word race and the phraseology of the question was very complicated and very difficult to decide. And I, to be honest, I don't have the exact way they phrased it here, but they asked people to self-identify as Afro-descended and 2.9% of the population, so nearly 3% of the population of Mexico self-identified. That's higher than tallies earlier. And it's not that there are more Afro-descended people now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, it's the growing work of activists and encouraging folks to consider that as an acceptable part of their culture and history and background. There is currently one Afro-descended senator in Mexico, and here she is with her hand out, Maria Chales Sanchez. Um, I want to end on a bit of a sadder note, but I'm going to keep that picture up of um, Senator Sanchez to encourage us. We talked to some historians who focused especially on um, children and what they are learning about race in me the Mexican educational system. So some of them had done studies of history textbooks, textbooks for Mexican children saying, where are they encountering people um, who are Afro-descended, they noted very few images of Afro-descended people, and those images that they did note tended to be troubling images that were associated with slavery or frequently were of people in the nude, images that did not help children understand the vitality of the Afro-descended community and the importance that Afro-descended people have made to Mexican history. Studies with Mexican children, unfortunately, also show that they experience racism. They experience that as bullying, as exclusion from peer activities, and most horrifically, as different or worse treatment from teachers. Teachers, children feel that they are singled out by teachers for the color of their skin or their African background. Uh, adults, we, we spoke with many adults to have, who have experiences with racism, particularly when traveling, uh, being asked for documentation. One of our scholars, um, a man of rather dark skin talked about being tra traveling at one point and being approached while he was in a store um, by a policeman who he said had the same color skin as he did. And, and the policeman asked for his papers, his documentation. And the man said to the policeman, you know, brother, look at us. <laughs> We're the same. Why do you distrust me? Uh, and he said that was a, a conversation that was just going to go nowhere for him. I've heard stories of people being forced to leave planes and missing flights, being forced off of buses, 
and being treated in general as a people without a culture who bring the country of Mexico down. I can only hope and I believe, given all the people that we met, that um, the work of activists in Mexico will continue and will continue to shed a positive light on the contributions of people from the Afro descended population. And this will become seen as one of the glories of the Mexican culture and will take its place in the concept of mestizaje. I have come to the end of my notes and I would be grateful to share the conversation now. Let me stop share. Thank you, Heather. That was, I just feel like I've been on this amazing journey and we're only, you know, sort of scratching the surface, I think too, right? Um, so I would love uh, for anyone present, if you're so inclined to ask a question, feel free to unmute and jump right in. If you prefer that I ask it, it's perfectly fine for you to just type that in the chat and I'll present that to Heather. So at this point, yes, let's turn it over to your questions, observations, uh, maybe even just reflections on everything Heather just shared with us. Heather? Hi, Nicoletta. Hi, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and then when we are alone, we will discuss the relics, which I would love to buy. <laughs> but, but aside from that, um, I, a few years ago, I read a book that about the United States, Brazil, and South Africa, saying that the different um, the different color line had created different spirits. For in the United States, one one drop and you're black, and so. While, for example, in the in Brazil, oh yeah, it was Brazil, United States, and South Africa. In Brazil, it was a continuum. The lighter you wear, the better you wear, and it was a very uneasy discussion. But I wonder, in light of the mestizajo that you describe, how would you set this color line in Mexico? Um, so I, I need to say, first of all, that I'm, I'm not an expert here, um, but my colleagues, my American colleagues, frequently referred to Mexican television. And they said, if we're all the same, then why are we not seeing people on, the t on TV programs in Mexico that have a wide range of skin colors? Um, so they, they said, you know, we see in the media examples of this colorism where technically we're all the same, but we're definitely going to uh, preference people with lighter skin. I see, okay. So it's not a, a sad situation, but still it's something that is perceived as pretty much sad. Okay, thank you. I'm not an expert either, but I found it extremely fascinating at three incredible places, quote unquote, like South Africa and Brazil and United States have dealt with. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, if I may add, and I think uh, it, that, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, um, uh, that goes back to what Heather was mentioning, I think, about the um, effort, well, effort um, uh, around the mestizaje, the, the mestizaje sort of. Uh, mm, the mission of mestizaje in Mexico, which was, as, as Heather so well uh, said it, uh, was an attempt to sort of simplify uh, the cultural diversity and the cultural heritage. And, um, and along the way, marginalizing even further the African component. And, uh, and there were, so many attempts by the, the ministry, the Ministry of Education um, that, that portrayed this image of Mexico um, that if it enhanced the indigenous component, right? Uh, such as we see in Diego Rivera's uh, paintings and in so many examples of art and culture, um, it, really uh, used that mm, term of mestizaje to, to not only to marginalize the African component, but also to um, move towards that whitening, that blanqueamiento, that whitening, that 
uh, sadly became sort of the norm, I would say after the revolution, right? After perhaps after the after the revolution, because the revolution sort of uh, was used as well to sort of uh, heighten the indigenous um, the, the the indigenous uh, heritage of Mexico, uh, and and but um, so that the, the, that was a, there was sort of a, uh, a rise of 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 representation of that indigenous. Uh, repre uh, um, representation spirit that was sort of a product of the of the revolution, um, given that it was a people's revolution, peasant revolution, and Zapata and in, and uh, Diego Rivera and these muralists were sort of commissioned to paint that history. Which, if we look, as you said, if we look at those paintings, the the African component is is mix, is missing so um, but there was a height of the indigenous component but then as the 20th century moves on and this mestizaje sort of mission um, uh, is established the uh, even the indigenous component of Mexico sort of dies down I would say and that's when <clears throat> I mean when we start seeing the image of uh, the Europeanization image of Mexicans. Yes, and so, sorry, it was. No, thank you. I was traveling on the train, listening, and and then just came back, and anyway. And, and on that, um, sorry, on that I am reminded of uh, Vasconcelos' book, The Comic, Cosmic Race, which actually is sort of the Bible of that mestizaje, sort of a impulse in Mexico, which the African component is nowhere in that, uh, in that sort of book, which becomes sort of the Bible of Mexican uh, identity. I just want to add that uh, Heather, sorry that I mean it's uh, the the work and the detail uh, of your presentation, the connections that you make, even with the United States, that part that is totally I mean uh, invisible as well is is really so very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I don't I yeah, don't know if you ahead. saw in the chat. There is a question that just came in. Um, about whether you would speak to or agree to the fact that slavery may have been viewed differently in Mexico than the US, but the outcome seems somewhat similar. Um, I, and again, so I can share what I remember from speakers and I would hesitate to put my own ideas forward. Um, one, we had one speaker in particular I remember who was very um, adamant at, at pointing out differences. So she, I, I'm not sure she would say the, the outcome was similar. And I don't know whether you mean like the outcome for an individual or the outcome for the countries. For the countries, we have slavery. Well, the importation of slavery was at what, 1800 that that stopped, but still obviously the practice of slavery in the United States um, continues into the Civil War. It comes crashing to a halt, but is replaced by very quickly by J um, Jim Crow and um, separate and unequal. So we, we know that history here. I think slavery in Mexico largely petered out. Um, it wasn't, and my guess is that's not for humanitarian reasons, but it's simply for practical reasons, that it wasn't as beneficial or seen as necessary. And so we see the numbers of enslaved people dropping through the seven even starting in the 1600s and through the 1700s and by the 1800s there are very few enslaved people left so to abolish slavery in the early 1800s in Mexico is not the huge step that would have been say to imagine the abolition of slavery in 1820 in the United States um, that's not to say that afro-descended people were treated 100 percent equally but um, the institution of slavery came to a very different end in a different way. Whether that outcome feels the same for individual people, 
I, I don't dare to speak about that. I would want to know lots of particular cases so that we could see the lives of individuals and what it looked like on, on that kind of granular basis. But if anyone knows more about that, please contribute it. Other questions? I have a few, but I want to make sure that everybody who, that others are able to. Well, let me ask, so I, this is kind of connected to what Lucia just mentioned in, in the complimented sort of how the detailed sort of um, nature of the presentation. I was really intrigued by the artwork and, you know, you have an opportunity as a, a visiting scholar sometimes to get access to texts and materials and resources that the average person cannot access. So I was curious, um, you know, when you were collecting the images, some of those were your own photos, some of those were, um, you know, the pieces of art. Did, did you have like a special access to that artwork or is that artwork that actually can be readily accessed or seen in Mexico and you just have to kind of know what to look for um, and where to look? Uh, so it's, I think there's a whole interesting, fascinating narrative <laughs> in the art in and of itself. That's it's a long question just to say, tell me more about how you got all of that. Yeah, a little bit of some different different pieces. I think the first image um, showing the conquistadors and then the person with darker skin there, that I took a picture as one of our presenters was offering her presentation. So she could tell you where that came from. Though I did have a picture later that I took myself when we were in... Um, the Castillo, I think it is, in, in the Chapultepec Park in Mexico City, uh, so that historical museum up at the top of the mountain, there was an image from the 1700s that show an Afro-descended person in beautiful livery, you know, full 1800s, gold buttons and lace and everything. Um, and it shows the city scene. It is, so it's an attempt to show this is what life looked like in Mexico City at this time. And there are several people of distinctly darker color on that image. So having been present at all these lectures, I, I took a couple of pictures there, but that's something that everyone would have access to. However, it's an enormously large image. So you kind of have to hunt and look and be patient. Um, we did, get entrance to, I think it's the Ministry of Education in Mexico City, which is surrounded by an enormous amount of Diego Rivera murals. And the image that I put, I think on the Mestizaje slide with the woman holding the ears of corn, that was um, Diego Rivera. I'm sure you all, you all noticed that. And exactly like um, Dr. Ortiz said, he really elevated the role of the indigenous population and probably romanticized that as well in making his political points. Um, so that was something that we were granted access to. Um, likewise, the, the, the image from the slide that came from our presenter. So I stole that. Um, I see, I am the thief. <laughs> Uh, but some of it were, were, were paintings that were available for anybody. And then I did some online digging as well so that, because I knew you didn't want to watch my face talk for an hour. So I, I tried to find some images that would help to support the story. So if I may, as a follow-up to that, because I was interested also in what you were saying about the activists and the sort of work that they've done to study textbooks, to you share that the images that are in those history books in the schools are not the ones we saw tonight. Oh, and um, I looked, I tried to look online. So I confess that I didn't take pictures during that presentation. I think that may have been a Zoom presentation where our presenter wasn't in the room with us. Um, and so I, I didn't take pictures during that one, but she had images from history textbooks for middle school children, for elementary school children, and, and some, you know, appalling images. Well, and I'm, you know, are the, so we're sort of really struggling at this moment in our own country, right, in our own context to figure out how to tell the story. Um, and is there, is there hope for the activists in Mexico that they can take those textbooks, rework them, present the history in its full spectrum, and will they face you know, as much pushback as we're, I, I don't wanna to draw too many comparisons here, but it's that it, I think that given our current political context, I was thinking about education and the role of education and the work that the activists in Mexico are, are doing, especially if it's the decade, right, of Afro-descended people. Yeah. 
and I, I could be reading this wrong, right? I'm not a Mexican. I'm not in the culture all the time. We were there surrounded by scholars for whom this is their life work and activists for whom this is what they love. And we were already audience for them. So that may have skewed how it felt, but it felt to me like a hopeful time. It felt like a time where, hey, we've got a senator. All right, let's go. Let's see if we can get a representative as well. It felt to me like... Um, a wave that's still rising and cresting and good things are still coming and people are still gathering. You know, that list of all these things that have happened in the last decade or two decades felt like, hey, we're building steam. Um, but I have no doubt that the Mexican, the Afro-Mexican community also watched the United States through the murder of George Floyd and subsequent horrific um, examples of violence against our own Afro-descended people. And no doubt there was a certain feeling of uh, hopelessness associated with that as well. Um, so I, but, but to me, it felt in general more hopeful, like good things were being made to happen. The, if I may add, uh, I mean, the fact that, um, the fact that you were actually able to uh, as a scholar of the, in the United States that not, is not uh, an anthropologist of, you know, in, 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 in the field or a, a, an expert, say, right? A scholar in an anthropologist uh, that, anthropologist that studies Mexican, Afro-Mexican culture and that these uh, educators um, were actually given the opportunity to explore that, that alone in terms of scholarship is, is a very important step moving forward. And, uh, and I think that the whole Black Lives Movement, as it's always said um, throughout Latin America, if the United States sneezes, Latin America gets a cold, right? And so, in terms of positive influence, or I mean, all in, all sorts of influences. So, so uh, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, has had, I think, a positive impact. I mean, given the publicity, given the fact that so many people now have access to social media and have seen that, and uh, they they have used something so tragic. Uh, to actually advance their, I mean, their, uh, their struggle, because this is a struggle that, I mean, goes back to, and you put it so well again, so to so many years, and now, now, uh, finally, people are learning more about that, uh, the, the, what, it, what was known as the third rule, now the second rule, some people will also sort of question that, right? Those terms. Um, so I think it is, it, it is, I mean, I see more and more attention being paid to that, to Afro-Mexicans. I wish more of my students in Latin American history, I mean, were here because we are discussing the, the, the subject of, I told you, and um, I, I have a couple that are, I saw a couple that are in my other classes, but none from the Latin American history course. Oh my God. So for us, it's also sort of a, you know, this <laughs> effort, yeah. right? Yeah. To let them know about these things and, and make the connections also. Make right. the connections as you, as you made them in, in you know, at, the, at that level with the United States, also to make the connections um, and questions, make, uh, ask the questions about race, right? Blackness and Afro-descendants and, you know, in, in other parts besides their communities or, right? Mm. Sorry, you can make them watch the video. You can assign the video when it's available. Yes, I will. Um, 
I we have we have one last question that just came in, Heather, um, right. and it's about the term mestizo. Was the term a fixed meaning, meaning, excuse me, or just as a formal label in a form of documentation? Um, the, the second part was, did some use the term comfortably for self-identification? I think yes to all of that. So mestizo could be early on um, contrasted with mulatto. Mulatto would be somebody with some European and some African heritage, whereas mestizo would be somebody with European and indigenous heritage. You know, there was that passion for categorization that was going on in the 1600s and 1700s. Um, but I think folks do use it now. Uh, we encountered the uh, situation where folks would talk about mestizaje, this mixture, and they would translate it as miscegenation. And we we're like, yeah, no, that's not a term we can use <laughs> in the United States, given our history with that word. For them, it just seemed, you know, that's what the, the dictionary said. Oh, mestizaje means miscegenation. And we said, no, you know, in an American context, that term has so much connected to it that it can't be. So like we, I would use mixture. Um, I think folks did. I think folks would say, you know, yes, I'm mestizo or mestiza. Um, and here again, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm not maybe the best one to speak to this, but even to go further than that, um, we heard one speaker who talked about family members of fairly dark skin, you know, an uncle who would be known as El Negro, the dark one, or the aunt was known as La Morena, the brown one. Um, and some folks that we encountered said that's part of Mexican culture, just using um, adjectives to nickname someone and that just happens and so it doesn't have any sort of implication and other people say no this is intolerable it does so I feel like we got different reads on the, the use of language there yeah. thank you Heather the Latins people will call the one you know the hunchback or the curly one. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a famous story of somebody who uh, put his hand on the fire to, and then became uh, the lefty, I mean, the right one, it was burned. So I do understand what, what Heather says. I think different languages have a different relationship with nicknames that we feel a little bit uh, mm -hmm. um, not exactly what we would do, but yes, so. And, then, and I'm glad that Heather um, mm, pointed so much about the term, the term Afro-descendant, because it is, uh, I mean, the, the word uh, negro, right, in Spanish, which is black, it's, it's very widely used. But um, for many, many people, thankfully now, throughout Latin America, I mean, that is no longer, an appropriate word to refer to. I mean, given that what it implies in terms of the differentiation between people. So they would use of African heritage or uh, Afro-descendant. However, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not too uh, knowledgeable of the Mexican case, uh, it is, in, in many places, the word Negro has been used as the Indian word in the United States by the communities uh, to actually, they sort of appropriated the term to actually mean, not redefine, but define themselves. Sort of as, as, as the term Indian, for example, in the United States that is used by Native Americans it's historically appropriate. So, and I, I think it's good also because it's an invitation to the right, to, to the person that they are speaking to, communicating to, to actually question the term. And then for the um, activist that, or right, the person that is in that community that chooses uh, itself to, uh, be called Negro, Comunidades Negras, this and that, or what have you, so that it is a term that uh, is to be discussed. Because that way you are communicating 
and all hopefully opening the door to others to learn about the history of the people that use that term. I think that's what the indigenous people in the United States sort of try to do with the appropriation of the word Indian. All right, well, we are out of time, but, but I think there's a conversation here that could continue. And so I encourage you to continue discussing points that Heather brought up tonight. Heather, on behalf of the entire mission committee, thank you so very much for uh, a wonderful presentation and kicking off this year's lecture series. Um, please do faculty, please consider uh, putting in your own proposal if you're interested in the topic of border and bonds and encourage other colleagues to do so. Um, I, and then keep checking the webpage uh, if you're interested in that video and using that um, in class or for your own purposes, um, we'll try to get up as soon as possible. So thank you all again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. And I look thank forward to seeing you at the next lecture. Thank, thank you, Heather. Heather. That was thank wonderful. You all. Thank, thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.